uh, of course, today's lecture, which is, of course, talking about ancient Greece uh, overall. Um, see here. Now, of course, there is, uh, well, there's going to be like a couple pow power PowerPoint lectures I'll have. I've got, I think, two posted. I don't know if I've got two or not. I think I've got two posted right now. I know there's a part one that I've got up right now, which is this one right here. Uh, there'll be a part two later. I'll see if I posted that or not. I'm not sure. And then there'll also be one on the rise of Macedonia, uh, the Hellenistic Age under Alexander the Great. So I'll have that up too. Probably, I mean, maybe next week I might have that up later. Not right now, though. So anyway, um, like I said, I'm going to continue, of course, talking about uh, the background of ancient Greece. Now, Greece, uh, if you know much about it, uh, is basically the birthplace you know, of a lot of your Western culture, Western civilization. So uh, the Greeks have had a major influence on a lot of people, uh, not just, you know, people in that area, but the Roman world uh, has been heavily influenced by it a lot. Medieval thought, too, uh, believe it or not, is also uh, kind of influenced by it uh, as well. Uh, and um, it is one of the first European civilizations that you have. Uh, if you really think about it, mostly based on, uh, you look at this map here, I can show you kind of the location of where it is. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about mostly pre-Hellenic age, which I'll get to in a second about that. But um, this, this is kind of a map showing you the geography of where the Greek world is. Uh, predominantly, the Greek world is kind of situated between Turkey over here, which is Asia Minor, and then uh, Greece. You know, mainland Greece, which is right here, it's kind of sandwiched between like, like above the Mediterranean Sea. So from Crete all the way up into Thrace, Turkey, Greece, and all that, all that, of course, uh, is basically around what they call the Aegean Sea, Aegean Basin. And that's mostly where the Greeks all lived like a long time ago. Most of them did uh, anyway. Uh, some did live like around the Black Sea over here. Also, southern Italy and Sicily over here uh, as well. But predominantly, this was known as like the Greek world uh, in this area. And uh, I believe it was Plato who once commented that the Greeks lived around the Aegean Sea like a frog, like frogs around a pond. You've heard that quote about that. Uh, and um, of course, they were saying about all these different Greek city states they have later. There's like, you know, hundreds of them, I guess, that existed there at one point, at least 150 or more. There dominant ones ahead uh, overall. So, um, so yeah, that's just kind of, kind of talking about, the, you know, the Greek world. Uh, we will, of course, today be getting into mostly talking about the pre-Hellenic age, which is like the, um, what I call the, um, Hellenic is like the Greek age, I think they call it, which is mostly around the time of the Olympics, 8th century BC, down to the time of Alexander the Great. So that's considered the so-called Hellenic Age or Greek Age. And then we're talking about the pre-Hellenic Age, just before that, which is usually called either the Greek Bronze Age or also called the Aegean Civilization. Uh, I did have some other terms I did want to talk about, too, before I get started with that period uh, overall. Uh, let me bring it up real quick here. But uh, the term Europe, which we're talking about right now, um, I've got a little slide I could put up right here, but the origin of the word Europe uh, comes from famous uh, mythological character that the Greeks talked about named Europa. You may have heard of her. It's where the word Europe comes from. Kind of like the mother of Europe. I think they sometimes dub her. And uh, she was this uh, Phoenician, Phoenician princess that was supposedly kidnapped by Zeus and brought to where the island of Crete is, which you saw on that map a uh, second ago, right here on the southern uh, Aegean on the Mediterranean Sea here. And um, she went on to father, I uh, think you may, maybe you've heard of one of the famous kings of Crete, Cretan ruler who was very well known to the Greeks a long time ago, which was King Minos, you know, associated with the legend of the Minotaur uh, and all that. And so that's why she's kind of considered like the mother of Europe and, where the word Europe comes from. And so uh, the term Europa was also used by, um, I think, uh, Galileo, 
and he, of course, named one of the moons of Jupiter uh, later. So, but anyway, yeah, first I'm going to, of course, today talk about, um, of course, uh, the period of the so-called Greek Bronze Age. We're going to get to that first uh, today, like I said. Uh, it's also dubbed the Aegean Civilization because it had all these different cultures uh, that were living in and around the Aegean Basin uh, at the time. And um, there were mostly two main groups. That were the most dominant. Yeah, the Minoan culture, which you may have heard of, which was really the oldest one of the two. And they had another one called the Mycenaean culture uh, as well. So both both were kind of in and around the Aegean. Uh, Minoans were actually living in the Aegean, like on the islands. And then the Mycenaeans were living mostly on the mainland. So they lived about 4,000 years ago. And they, they're around to like the end of the Bronze Age, like close to the Bronze Age collapse. It's about when they or around first. Let me go ahead and first talk about the Minoans. I'll get to the Mycenaean culture, of course, later. Uh, the Minoans, uh, of course, is the oldest, like I said, of the two we're talking about, Minoan and Mycenaean. And um, the Minoans were mostly known uh, for being like a maritime civilization. They were kind of like the Phoenicians. They, they were known for sailing throughout the Aegean, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, they think they traded with the, like the Egyptians, the Egyptians at the time. Uh, if you read about that later, and um, they were mostly based on different islands. They were based mostly on the island of Crete, which I showed you on that, that map, that large island that's kind of at the bottom of the Aegean. Also, they were in an area called the Cyclades, the Cyclades, and um, uh, anyway. Um, Cyclades is a series of islands, which I'll show you, that are based in the southern part of the Aegean, which are like right here. Now, you may have heard of Santorini, which is a famous resort island, which is, I think, about right here. And uh, so the uh, Minoans had some kind of um, empire, trading empire, I guess they believe, that controlled vast amounts of uh, territory that were based just mostly in the Aegean overall. So yeah, they're considered to be like the first really European civilization. Uh, they think the Minoans uh, and they think they influenced other cultures, you know, later like the Mycenaean culture and I guess future Greek culture uh, that'll come, of course, later. Now they did have a um, this archaeologist that was um, famous for discovering their culture. His name was Sir Arthur Evans. Uh, he lived in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and um, Evans uh, had known, I'll, I'll talk about this other archaeologist uh, that went by the name Heinrich Schliemann. You, you may have heard of him who did a lot of uh, excavations that dealt with the Mycenaean culture in the mainland and also ancient Troy which they found in Turkey. And um, evidently um, what happened was Schliemann told Evans that there might be evidence on Crete of the Mycenaean culture. And so Evans went there. And that, by the way, is the wrong date. It was, I don't know why I've got that on there. Let me edit that. But that should be, um, I believe it's 1900. It's about when he went there. He went to the island of Crete, 1900. And what he found there was something totally distinct culture that wasn't Mycenaean. They found the Mycenaean culture there too, but Minoan culture was believed to be older there. Uh, and he began excavating this site called Canossus. Canossus uh, was a um, some kind of Minoan city. Uh, and they think it was also a, a pa palace complex because the Minoans were known for building palace complexes as part of their cities, where I guess their kings ruled uh, and all that. And uh, according to Greek mythology, King Minos may have ruled from there. I think they believe anyway. That's the theory they have about it. And um, so um, Evans began reconstructing it. You know about Canossus. He actually rebuilt parts of it. At least the first couple stories that were rebuilt by him. And yeah, it's a big tourist attraction every year. I think that's the biggest thing on Crete. Uh, to go see, of course, is the 
the uh, ruins of Canossus, uh, which are, of course, still there. So that's who Sir Arthur Evans is. Uh, Evans, I'll get to later, found some other stuff about it. But Evans was the one that, um, he's the one that coined the name Minoan. So I think originally they called Cretans, the people that lived in that area, uh, like on Crete. Uh, but he started calling them Minoan. Uh, and the name kind of stuck in the 20th century. And of course, he named them that because of King Minos. So that's the reason for it. I'll show you later, but he also found their language. I got a I got some pictures of that I can show you, but he did he discovered that too, just called Linear A on the actual island itself. Now, of course, one of the most famous stories associated with, of course, uh, King Minos. Here, of course, another picture of it if you want to see. Oh, I, I can show you some pictures real quick. Of course, they found this so-called throne room that's there that maybe might have been the throne of where King Minos and other Cretan rulers uh, may have rained from, so it's actually still there. I'll get to the fresco paintings, which are, of course, they're known for as well, but you can see pictures of how they've kind of reconstructed parts of it, of uh, Canossus right there. Here's some more pictures of it <clears throat> as well. So yeah, they've built, rebuilt some, some sections of like the second story of it, and they do think that Canossus may have had multi-storied levels, like three, four levels to it, apartment buildings, had some kind of fancy courtyard that was in the center as well of the actual complex. And there's some interior shots of it too. You can see they even use like, they think columns inside, which was kind of around at the time. The Egyptians were already building columns and so on. Now, of course, one of the most famous stories of uh, is King, uh, King, of course, um, the story of King Minos and uh, the uh, Minotaur. Uh, which is well known. Bring that down a little bit so you can see. Yeah, the Minotaur. And uh, the Minotaur is a famous legend uh, that the Greeks used to tell about the Cretans or Minoan culture overall. Uh, they think it's more of a legend. So they're probably not a true story, but it's a story that's been around uh, for a long time. I guess over two, two 3,000 years ago. Uh, and um, <clears throat> anyway, supposedly King Minos uh, in the story had this uh, white bull he had, and he was supposed to sacrifice it to the um, god Poseidon. At least that's the legend of the Greeks. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to keep it for himself, this bull. And so Poseidon got angry. And if you know the story about this, uh, he had um, somehow um, King Minos had a wife named Pasiphaea in she, she lusted for the bull. <laughs> yeah. And it had sex with a bull. Yeah. Bizarre story. And of course, the offspring of it was a monster, which was the so-called Minotaur, which was half bull, half man, basically. And it was so grotesque that they put it in a maze or a labyrinth that was supposedly part of the palace complex, which some claim is actually there at the Canossus complex or nearby. Some say there's, I think there's some mines nearby, and some people think that's where it might be. At least they think, theorize anyway. Uh, and, uh, and of course, what happened was every so many years, I believe it's uh, how many years is it? I thought it was every nine years they had to give sacrifices to it. Uh, seven boys and seven girls would be sent into it to be eaten alive. It was a man eater. Uh, and supposedly the city state that sent. Um, the boys and girls was the uh, city state of Athens they had to send, they had to pay tribute because I think they had, uh, there was a story about how they, um, Thenians, there had been like an accident and they'd killed one of his sons or something like that. And so he made them send tributes basically to be eaten by it, eaten by the Minotaur. Uh, so what happened was the uh, king of uh, Athens, his name was, um, I think his name was, um, what was his name? It was oh Aegeus, King Aegeus. And he sent his son, uh, Theseus. Uh, Theseus, he was a famous Greek hero. And he uh, eventually used a ball of uh, like yarn, basically, to go into the maze, kill the Minotaur, and, of course, make his way out. So it's kind of a bizarre story, but um, they don't think it's probably a true story. I think it's more or less a story where the Greeks were trying to, you know, um, say bad things about the Cretans, you know, and all that. 
or like propaganda or something like that. So anyway, um, now let me talk about a other, few other things, of course, about, um, of course, the um, one thing that the Minoans are very famous for is their artwork, which they have like what they call fresco paintings, these lime plaster paintings that they would put on walls, uh, basically. And um, like you see the bull leaping fresco, you can go look at later. I've got a bunch of paintings in the PowerPoint lecture if you want to go look at them later. And um, anyway, uh, that's the most famous one, which a lot of these have been touched up, you know, you know that. Uh, they put them in homes. They put them in palaces and stuff like that uh, overall. And um, can we blow it up? It's okay. I can see it bigger if you want. But um, see, yeah, it's basically, you know, how big they were um, like that. Uh, other ones I've got, too, if you want to look at it, uh, let's see, some other paintings. Um, let me see. They've got this one. They show a lot of paintings of, like, animals and wildlife. I know um, here's a bunch of them here showing birds. Now, there's a fisherman. Uh, of course, you can see right there. Uh, also, two boys in the right boxing. Uh, there's some uh, pic paintings of women uh, and the way they would do their hairstyles. A lot of women would also have open blouses like they didn't wear like tops or anything like that as well uh there's a painting in Canossus uh, that the com palace complex showing like blue the so-called blue dolphins which might be one of the most famous paintings in there besides the um bull leaping which the bull leaping thing i don't know if you've heard stories about that but there was a supposedly a um some kind of sport or acrobatic type act that 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 was usually put on during um, some kind of religious festivals where you had young men or boys would jump on the bull's back, like balance themselves and jump off. It was some kind of sport they were kind of known for. Because uh, suppose the, the Minoans were the ones that kind of started like what would be later, almost like bullfighting, I guess they would call it later. They also have boxing and wrestling and other sports like that that they kind of supposedly invented uh, and all that. Here's another um, painting depicting uh, this um, young, I guess, Minoan man. I don't know who he is. They don't know who he is. It's kind of a mystery. Uh, but so you can see they didn't wear a lot of clothes. That's one thing because it's a very warm climate uh, living in the Aegean Basin. Let's see what else. Uh, oh, um, oh, Minoans were known for a lot of pottery and stuff because they um, they exported a lot of like wine and olive oil. That's something they were known for. They have found like Minoan pottery and other artifacts as far away as Cyprus and Egypt. So they trade with different areas of the Aegean and Mediterranean Sea uh, overall. Uh, then I told you about their language. Uh, they had a language... So I showed up here, which was called Linear A. That's what they usually dub it. Uh, it's a type of early language, uh, like a pre-Greek language, basically what it is, uh, before like Greek came in um, after 1200. And uh, it has not been translated. So it's kind of like one of these languages, kind of a mystery. I believe uh, it uses about, I thought it was like 80 symbols or something like that. And it's usually written on tablet form. Uh, kind of like he saw in Mesopotamia, either clay or stone tablets. Uh, and um, I think they have like a, they figured out that it has an alphabet, but they have not been able to translate it, which is kind of a mystery, you know. So uh, mostly what they know about the um, Minoan culture comes from archaeology or from what the Greeks talked about them through mythologies and things like that. I think Herodotus has some stuff on him, maybe a little bit um, as well. But there's like not too much known, you know, outside of that. Now, of course, one of the big things that's a mystery, of course, about the Minoan culture uh, is um, they eventually declined. You know about this, like drastically, like just overnight, they just vanished uh, as a culture, which is one of the things we need to talk about a little bit as well. Uh, and um, if you know about the Minoan, the Minoan culture, like the decline of it, is uh, often been compared uh, to 
like what happened to like the Mayan culture. Uh, and also I told you about what happened to the um, that Indus Valley civilization. They kind of like just got snuffed out overnight. And there's been a lot of mystery about what happened. And um, it's believed that some kind of volcanic eruption that happened in the Aegean later destroyed their culture uh, and wiped out their naval fleets, maritime fleets that they had which you know, have had a lot of power. And it's believed that uh, on what is Santorini, which was called a long time ago by the Egyptians, they called it Thera, T-H-E-R-A, you see. That island was built on a volcano. Uh, and of course, what happened was they think sometime close to 1600 BC, either in the 17th or 16th century, it's still debated today, massive volcanic eruption occurred, so-called Thera eruption, and destroyed uh, that island. It had a, a port city there called Akrotiri. It was actually wiped out. In fact, the actual ruins of it, they found, I think, in the 1960s. That's the other thing that's famous, too, is Akrotiri on uh, Santorini, which is very well known. But they destroyed it, uh, and then uh, a bunch of the islands were destroyed, including Crete, they think, uh, when the volcano blew up. It created a bunch of massive tidal waves, basically tsunamis, uh, that wiped out Crete pretty much afterwards. I think they said they found debris later halfway up uh, Mount Ida, Ida, Mount Ida, which is the tallest mountain on Crete, got halfway up the, the mountain. That's crazy. Uh, that's how high the uh, tsunamis got. So that pretty much caused the decline of the Minoan culture. Uh, later, the Mycenaeans would come in, and they'd kind of just take over what's left at that point of uh, the Minoan culture. Um, of course, later, there's a, you know, if you know about the story of Atlantis, you've probably heard about that story. There's been a lot of similarities where they, they've been compared. Uh, Minoans and Atlantis. Uh, of course, the Greek uh, philosopher Plato later wrote about that uh, around the 4th century B.C., uh, he was writing about this probably about, you know, 1,200 years later, I guess, or probably more than that, 1,200, 1,300 years later, I think, they believe. A lot of his knowledge was probably from secondhand information that they think originated from the Egyptians. They think the Egyptians first discovered uh, what happened to the Minoans, how uh, being destroyed and all that. And that was related to the Greeks, and the Greeks kind of took it, and eventually it kind of evolved into this story about Atlantis, which was supposed to be this great civilization that vanished overnight and sank into the sea. So it's kind of like similar to probably Akrotiri, you know, I'm guessing is what it is. So it's very interesting about that, about the Minoan culture. And so a lot of a lot of people do believe today, historians think that, yeah, that's maybe where the story originated. Uh, however, the Greeks had the story originating in um, the Atlantic Ocean. You know, Atlantis and so on, but they probably just mixed that up of where it was originally. So that's what happened to the Minoan culture. They were kind of round, um, short lived, uh, and then that culture influenced other cultures that came later, like Mycenaean Greek cultures, of course, so it would filter in uh, afterwards. So, anyway, enough about the Minoan culture. Let's go ahead and move on, of course, and uh, we're going to talk about the Mycenaean culture. Uh, which comes in next uh, that they have. I guess everybody can see this, hopefully. Uh, and um, now the Mycenaeans, uh, they were around the same time as the Minoan culture. They're not as um, maybe as dominant or not as uh, civilized, maybe, I guess, as the Minoan culture was. I think some theorize that the actual um, Mycenaeans were like a retrograde culture. That means a culture that was influenced by another culture in that original, uh, they think. Uh, the Mycenaean period is often called the Hella, Helladic period. It's one of the nicknames of it. And it kind of comes at the end of the Bronze Age too, uh, as well. Uh, they go down to like when the Greek, uh, the Bronze Age collapse, which happens around 1200, uh, they're around. They peak about 16th to about the 12th centuries BC. And... Um, the difference in the culture was that the um, 
Mycenaean culture was located on the mainland. They're like mostly in like the southern part of Greece, you know, where Sparta and Athens is later. Uh, but they do go into the Aegean as well. And they take over Crete, et cetera, where the Minoans are uh, and all that. And they, so they control that area <clears throat> as well. Um, the cultures, they, they kind of discovered that one first, like going back to the 1800s, people kind of knew about the Mycenaean culture uh, overall. Although their language, which was called Linear B, uh, was not discovered uh, until like early 1900s by Arthur Evans. I think he was one of the first to really find the language and actually give it its name. He would call it Linear B uh, because Minoan, when he called it Linear A, they think they're maybe somehow related uh, to each other, like the Minoans language influenced the Mycenaean language. And um, they think that the Linear B language was like a type of pre-Greek language that later influenced uh, the development of Greek. Because uh, I think the theory about Greek uh, came about was that Greek evolved from probably the Minoan Mycenaean languages, and it was merged with Phoenicia. And that's how it kind of evolved into what it would be, uh, so-called archaic or old Greek, Greek that'll kind of develop later by the time of, you know, Homer, uh, the Greek poet. Um. And, of course, they uh, will talk more about the Mycenaean culture. The Mycenaeans were more known for their heavily fortified cities, which they built a lot uh, throughout uh, the Greek mainland uh, that they had. They'd be kind of like the Greek city-states or polis uh, that will develop later. Uh, most of they were based in um, parts of the Peloponnese is where most of them were. Like when you think of like Sparta, Athens, um, all those city-states, Thebes that you hear about later, uh, they think they were cities there, but they were like early Mycenaean versions that weren't like the later cities that would develop in the Greek age, Hellenic age, which will come after the 8th century and all that. And um, but a lot of them were built on hilltops, uh, which kind of gave them an advantage of the region, like a fortif fortified position and I guess a view of the area uh, that they're kind of controlling as a whole. The most famous, of course, was Mycenae. That was the, the big one, most famous city. And it's kind of where the name Mycenaean <clears throat> kind of, <clears throat> kind of all, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of all from. And um, Mycenae uh, is famous for its Greek architecture that, that, that's there. And uh, <clears throat> God, <clears throat> kind of cold, I think, a little bit. But um, but like it's famous for its Greek architecture. Of course, I'll get to in a second. It's known for its famous Lion Gate. Uh, that's there, the front entrance. Also, it did have at one point some type of palace palace complex. Uh, that was there. Uh, tombs and grave sites that were also excavated mostly around the 19th century, which I'll get to later. And um, I do have some pictures, of course, to show you all that area. Here, of course, uh, first of all, there's the pictures of Linear B you're looking at, uh, images of that. Uh, you can take a look at if you want. There are some pictures of the ruins of Mycenae in Greece. This is Mycenae itself um, right there. A lot of that's been excavated, probably rebuilt. Here's a map showing you of the actual city itself. So it has like some kind of fortified wall uh, that was built around it with a palace complex that was kind of in the middle, kind of like the Minoan culture, uh, had, which had the same kind of thing, like a type of palace complex as well. Uh, of course, there's the famous Lion Gate. That's probably the most famous feature probably they found at the city of Mycenae. It's probably been around for a long time. And uh, there, of course, is from the inside of it. They do think that the possibly the um, actual in that coat of arms, which I guess is in the middle of it, it's really a keystone that holds up the wall above the arch. It was likely some kind of keystone of the ruling family that controlled Mycenae. Uh, if you look at this, 
Uh, it's likely that um, it could have been maybe possibly the, you know, the coat of arms for the house of Atreus that may have reigned over Mycenae, uh, which of course later had famous kings like Agamemnon who reigned over it. Of course, Menelaus would later be a king of what is later Mycenae and Sparta uh, that they have. Uh, both were uh, sons of um, King Atreus. He was believed to have been a ruler of Mycenae, Mycenae a long time ago during the Greek Bronze Age. And uh, you'll notice like the walls, uh, they weren't built with any kind of mortar. Uh, they were kind of stacked up either with like uh, unmortared uh, stone or you saw in that other picture, they also used boulders as well. So they would also stack or put uh, in the walls as well. I think there was one right here, which showed some of the boulders being stacked up. So that's something commonly the kind of architecture uh, that they used a lot uh, at Mycenae. Uh, you'll notice that the walls, where was it? A lot of the construction at Mycenae was often called Cyclopean. That was a term they used, or Cyclopean masonry or walls, like or probably Cyclopean architecture or whatever. And um, for a long time, there was a legend or story that uh, Mycenae had been built by the one-eyed monster Cyclops. You may have heard of. <laughs> I don't know about that one. It was likely built by, you know, labor. I'm not sure they had slave. I guess they, they could have used slave labor. I don't know if they really know. Probably slave labor possibly Who knows about that. They must have been pretty skilled, though. So, but um, that's one of the, one of, one of two entrances. There's another one called, I believe, the postern entr entrance as well or postern gate that's also there but it's not as famous as of course the lion gate that's there now i next want to talk about heinrich schliemann schliemann of course if none of you have heard much about him he is of course very famous he was known for a lot of the archaeological ex excavations that were done at mycenae uh, he also done did some excavations at troy uh, which is in turkey uh, so Mycenae is in like the it's in part of southern Greece, uh, in what is the Peloponnese Peninsula of uh, Greece, and in uh, ancient Troy, uh, I'll get to it later. Is at a site called Hisarlik, uh, which uh, is in northwestern Turkey, now you know part of the Republic of Turkey today. Uh, a little bit about Schliemann. Schliemann was a um, German merchant uh, who was obsessed with the uh, stories of Homer. He, he, he read the, you know, the epic poems of uh, the Greek poet Homer. In fact, he actually was so good at it, he um, practically memorized. Uh, he could actually recite the, the epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, which he could do in Greek. <laughs> he, he knew like, I don't know how many, what was it 10, 15 languages he could speak? He was like really good linguistically. Yeah, I mean, like it says there, he was very good at that. Of multiple languages uh, and so on. Uh, after he retired as a merchant, uh, he uh, decided to get into archaeology. And so uh, Schleiman became known as one of the pioneers uh, in archaeology. Uh, although he is controversial, if you know about Schleiman, uh, Schleiman was known uh, for using dynamite. <laughs> Sometimes when he clear certain sections, <laughs> It is not something you're supposed to do as an archaeologist. I think dynamite was kind of fairly new at the time. Uh, what was that guy that invented it? Was that Nobel? I think it was the guy, Alfred Nobel. I think it was the guy who invented nitroglycerin, <laughs> which they used to make dynamite. Uh, but Schliemann uh, was known for, um, he excavated like and worked on some of these uh, tombs that were very famous at Mycenae and other sites, uh, which were these, uh, tombs of like the Mycenaean nobility and kings. They were called a tholos tomb or a beehive tomb, I think they call it. I've got, I think I've got pictures of that, a thought of one of them I've got, which is, um, it's right here, which that one is called, like it says there, it's called the treasury of Atreus. They think that might be possibly one of the tombs of maybe their kings. He called it that, uh, the treasury of Atreus. Uh, Schleiman. And uh, it's a type of um, 
supposedly like an underground tomb, which was built like in a honey, like a beehive shape. And it's buried with dirt on top of it. And they would put like the king in there, I guess, bury him and whatever kind of treasure that would be buried in it. So so-called tholos, which I think is a Greek word meaning, I guess it means like beehive, you know. Um, so yeah, Schliemann was known for discover, uh, for kind of excavating that or working with that. And no, uh, of course, his most famous thing he found were the uh, famous uh, grave circles uh, that are also at the site as well, like this one right here, a picture of one of the grave circles. I think there are two of like a grave circle, A and a B, and it's where like the um, Mycenaeans would bury a lot of the nobility. Uh, and um, he found that the um, Mycenaeans used what they call a shaft grave, where they would dig a shaft down, and they would bury people in there, and then they would um, bury artifacts with them. They'd put like they'd bury them with their armor, their shields, swords, daggers, trinkets, cups. They found like gold, like um, jewelry in there with them. And then, uh, of course, the most famous thing they found in there was the uh, so called Mask of Agamemnon, which is well known <clears throat> today. That's what you know, Schliemann called it the Mask of Agamemnon. He claimed it was maybe could have been Agamemnon. <laughs> they don't really know. It's found in the 1870s. Uh, and um, Schliemann was known for um, taking a lot of these artifacts back to Germany, which um, at the time, you know, that area was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we'll leave it Turkey later. He actually just snuck them out, <laughs> like under their nose. It was kind of, you know, conniving what he did there. And uh, he was, so he was kind of a shifty kind of guy, you know, uh, Schliemann. Uh, of course, later, the other thing that Schliemann's also known for, I did want to mention about, of course, Schliemann later found um, and excavated what is the site of um, ancient Troy, which I don't have too many pictures of that, but I've got maybe a picture of depicting part of the fortifications of his Sarlik, which they think might be ancient Troy, where the Trojan War you know, took place. Uh, and um, Schliemann in the 1870s, went there uh, and be, actually went there first, I believe, and excavated there and then went to uh, Mycenae and some other places, excavated there. And there's a famous story where he found this um, treasure there. They call it Priam's treasure is what he nicknamed it after King Priam, who may have been one of the kings, you know, the king of Troy later in the story of Homer's uh, story of the Iliad. And, um, Dug it out of a wall, 1873, they think, uh, they believe Schliemann. And uh, it had like a bunch of like artifacts that were all mostly, you see there, oh, that's like made of gold on the right. I don't think there's any color pictures I can find on that. But it was all made of gold gold artifacts. And all that eventually brought back to Germany uh, and all that. And um, so still debate debated about whether that's mice, that, that's um, Trojan, you know, artifacts that he found. So I think they did later some dating on it and we're kind of still wondering about that today, if it is or not. So, but yeah, Schliemann was known for like a lot of excavations that dealt with the Mycenaean world. And that's kind of what made him famous, uh, Schliemann. Uh, and um, he's like a pioneer in that area uh, overall. Now, I did want to get into and, of course, talk about uh, one more thing about, of course. Oh, and the guy that influenced him to go there, by the way, was this man named Frank Calvert, uh, who I believe was an American. I don't know he was an archaeologist, too, as well. He told him about this site in northwestern Turkey, which um, was called, I think, a Turkish name that was called Hisarlik, which means, uh, I think in Turkish it meant... Um, place of fortifications because it was evidently the city of some type that was built on an artificial hill or a tell and had like i think like nine cities built on top of each other and um i think it went all the way back to hittite times it may have been used as a fortified city that was there and i think up to the greek roman times it may have been used as a fortified city and 
Schleiman claims that uh, Troy 7, I think it is, is the city that might be Troy. Because they have numerous cities, like I said, they were built on top of each other. So, so yeah, so a Sarlik, like I said, is supposedly the site of where the Trojan War took place, which uh, the Trojan War, or where Troy was, um, that was a famous war that was fought over 3,000 years ago. It's kind of debated about when the war happened, or even if the war happened at all. Some of you will think it was just a made-up story. It didn't ever happen. Uh, but they think it had happened in the 13th century or maybe even the 12th century. I think 13th century is more popular, like 1250 B.C. Uh, seems to be a popular date, uh, more or less. But it was like this mythological war. It had, you know, depicted with the gods all in it. You know, the Greek Greek gods were involved in it uh, and all that. But it took place between the Greeks uh, in Europe, uh, which were, I guess, supposed to be called the Mycenaeans, although Homer doesn't call them that. He calls them Achaeans. So you may have heard of that name. And the Trojans, or, which is the city of Troy, that was in northwestern Turkey at the time. So those were kind of like rivals against each other. They may have been rivals because of trade, because you've got trade routes running from east to west, you know, through that area around the Aegean Sea. Uh, of course, the stories of the, uh, you know, Trojan War, of course, are based on the Greek poet Homer, uh, which they're not sure when Homer lived. It's kind of a debate about that. He lived either from the 19th to the 7th centuries BC. Uh, Herodotus, I believe, was the one that claimed that Herodotus claimed that um, that Homer lived about 400 years before he did, which would put him about 850 BC. So 9th century, I think the video said 8th century. So it's one of those two. Uh, but I think it's more like more into the Greek Dark Ages, which we'll talk, the Greek Dark Age, which, you know, I think he was writing at that time, which would maybe put it more like 9th century, maybe more than 8th. 8th century, I think, is kind of after the Dark Age ends. So I put it like probably at least 9th century, uh, at least. Um, he had two books, of course. You see the Iliad, and then they had the other one called the Odyssey, which you may have read both of those, I'm sure. Uh, Iliad, of course, more famous. Um, uh, the word Iliad, by the way, um, comes from the word Ilios, which was the Greek word for what they call Troy. So the the name Iliad is like the Greek name. Uh, and I think the Romans called, um, I think Ilium was also used by the Romans, but the term Troy is a later name that they use for the word Troyes, I think was another term they use as well. So yeah, that, that story, of course, very famous because of course, because of Homer and um, Homer may have been one of the, one of the, the uh, you know, Greek poets that influenced the Greeks to kind of develop, you know, the language. I think as they theorize anyway, that's why they developed develop the uh, Greek language, like uh, Ionic or Ionic Greek and Doric Greek, probably to write down his stories uh, at one point. I think he was some kind of bard poet. And I think the legend about Homer is that he was likely blind. Of course, some people think there may have been more than one Homer or he never existed. Kind of like Shakespeare. Some people think Shakespeare didn't write his plays. Kind of like that, you know, as well. So now, uh, of course, Homer uh, claims that the reason why the Trojan War broke out was because of the Trojan prince, Paris. I think you heard the story about him. Uh, they were on some kind of diplomatic mission to Sparta where he met Helen. And he took her, took him, took her with him back to, of course, Troy, married her. She became known as Helen of Troy, of course. She was actually the wife and queen of the king of Sparta, which was, of course, Menelaus. Uh, and uh, according to the Greek gods, anyway, uh, the story goes that the reason why Paris ended up with Helen was because Paris was uh, asked to uh, judge which of the uh, Greek goddesses was the most beautiful. He was given this apple, we may have heard of, called the Apple of Discord, and he chose Aphrodite, or Venus, as the most beautiful. And so... Uh, Vanelli, you know, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, uh, made Helen fall in love with Paris, and they went back to, uh, of course, uh, Troy, and that was it. 
so that really angered uh you know you know menelaus was the was the brother of agamemnon they're from the same you know house of atreus i told you about so agamemnon got in there involved too he was he would be the one that would lead the greek forces uh, they would eventually cross the aegean that old saying you know the face that launched a thousand ships right about you know Helen of Troy, and um, it would eventually lead to a 10-year siege where the Greeks would lay siege to Troy to try to take it, uh, but Homer only covers like a short period actually at the end of the war, getting more into like how the Greeks, you know, won the war and all of that. Uh, there are different characters, and I always kind of give you a few of the major characters that were in it, but you can, we've talked about Agamemnon and Menelaus. Of course, they were, of course, the rulers of, like I said, of Mycenae and Sparta. Achilles, of course, was considered the greatest Greek hero or warrior, of course, that, you know, is in the Trojan War. He's the most famous character, really, in the whole Iliad overall. So he's their greatest warrior overall. Um, of course, he's famous for being vulnerable, if you remember correctly, and his Achilles heel uh, and all that. He was the king of the Myrmidons. Uh, Odysseus was also the king of Ithaca. He kind of plays kind of a role later uh, at the end of the war, because uh, supposedly Odysseus is the one that came up with the Trojan horse to basically um, take Troy uh, using, a, of course, a trick, which, of course, supposedly happened, which I don't know. It may or may not happen. I don't really know uh, for sure or not. Uh, and then on the other side, you got the Trojans. You got King Priam, of course, the leader of the Trojans in Turkey. And then he had two sons, Hector. Hector, of course, was the greatest Greek hero and warrior on the Trojan side. Uh, and then he had Paris, his younger brother, uh, the head. Uh, Hector uh, is known for his famous uh, fight with Achilles. Those two would, you know, fight it out in single combat. Uh, and Hector, of course, would be killed by Achilles uh, in battle. That's really the peak story of the whole you know, what happens uh, with the Trojan War. Now, the story about how Troy falls, that's not told by Homer. That's, I think, later writers kind of write about that uh, later. I think it's, uh, I think it's the Aeneid, I think, later. That's the kind of story in there about, I'll get to the Aeneid later. Virgil's got a story about that where he talks about how Troy fell uh, to, um, the Greeks because of the Trojan horse uh, story. Uh, but um, that's really the whole peak. Like if you read about, you know, the, the Mycenaean period, that's really the peak of the whole, you know, culture that they have. Because evidently after the Trojan War, the Mycenaean culture just collapsed like overnight, kind of like the Minoans did. But I think they seem to think that it wasn't caused by anything like a cataclysmic catastrophe like volcano, volcanoes blowing up or anything like that. They seem to think that they were probably invaded and conquered is what happened to uh, the um, <clears throat> the um, Mycenaean culture. It occurs at the same time when they're having the so-called Bronze Age collapse, which happens close to about 1200 BC. You get this hap happen throughout the, Magi uh, uh, the uh, Mediterranean Basin. Uh, and I told you before about the Sea Peoples that came in. You know, there are some theories that the Sea Peoples might somehow be related to the Greeks that come in later. Uh, and um, so this happens about 1200. You get the, you know, like an invasion of all these Iron Age peoples that start moving in uh, to the Aegean Basin. And uh, what it does, of course, it causes what they call the so-called Greek Dark Age follows afterwards, that they usually dub it, so-called Greek dark, which I can talk a few minutes about, I guess, uh, before I wrap this lecture up today, because I don't think we'll probably get the review. Uh, I could do that later, but um, let me see if I can find it, or maybe, oh, I, I do have to review, oh, oh, I do have a review section here, I can go ahead and go, but that's basically what's going to happen later, excuse me, is that uh, they're going to come in, and what's going to occur uh, is that I'll talk about the Hellens. The Hellens are going to come in, which is what they call Greek peoples that really take over like the Greek mainland and the Aegean basin uh, and all of that. I'll talk about Helen 
suppose it was the founder of these peoples and the different tribes that come in. And of course, that usually take over, you know, ancient Greece. Looks like I've got a review first. So I didn't realize that, but I can go ahead and do that real quick uh, about that. And, um, and then, of course, later I'll cover more into the background of later Greece. We'll get into what we call the Hellenic Age or Greek Age. I'll get into the rise of the, you know, the Greek city-states that we have uh, in this region. Yeah, I can go review real quick, and then I guess that'll be it uh, for this lecture for today. And then I can you know, continue on Wednesday with a, um, kind of a continuation of this section here. But yeah, it says around what sea did most, mostly ancient Greece develop as one of the first European civilizations, mostly the Aegean Basin, like between, like I told you, Turkey and the Greek mainland was mostly where all the Greeks lived. Uh, except maybe like around the Black Sea in southern Italy, Sicily. Uh, what mythological figures Europe named after? Because, uh, you know, the Greeks, the first European civilization, uh, that came from Europa. It was a Phoenician princess uh, in Greek mythology. She was considered like the mother of Europe and was like the mother of like King Minos, who was later a ruler in Crete. I guess one of the first rulers in Europe. Uh, what is the historical name for early Greekers when the Minoans and Mycenaeans flourished? Uh, it's called different names. Uh, Greek Bronze Age is quite common. Uh, they also call it the Aegean civilization as well. Also the pre-Greek period or pre-Hellenic age. Some people call it that sometimes as well because it's before the Hellens or Greeks invade and take over Greece. These are all like pre-Greek peoples that were there. Um <clears throat> Who were the Minoans? Uh, Minoans were a type of pre-Greek civilization uh, that was on the island of Crete, uh, and they were also uh, in the um, Aegean Islands, like the Cyclades. And uh, they were known for um, predominantly their um, maritime trade or civilization. Uh, what island did they mostly develop on? Of course, right here it says Crete. <laughs> yeah, island of Crete, of course, in the southern Aegean the top of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, who was the archaeologist who discovered the Minoans? What palace did he excavate in the early 1900s? That was uh, Sir Arthur Evans. And of course, he was famous <clears throat> for finding um, Canossus, which he kind of rebuilt part of it. Uh, who is the mythological king associated with the Minoans? Of course, King Minos, uh, of course, associated with the legend of the Minotaur. Uh, which we told you about. Uh, what was the main Minoan language discovered by Evans? He's what coined it. Uh, linear A, which is like a type of pre-Greek language that they were known for. What types of artwork were the Minoans famous for? Uh, of course, most famous, of course, was the fresco paintings that they were, would make on walls and, of course, palace complexes as well, like the bull-leaping uh, fresco you saw. What caused the Minoans to decline? They believe they were wiped out due to a volcanic eruption, often called the Thera eruption, where Santorini is. They think that led to eventually um, Crete being destroyed. Uh, what myth or legend is possibly associated with their decline? Uh, some historians believe today that the decline of the Minoans is somehow connected like the story of Atlantis, told by Plato. Uh, who were the Mycenaeans? Where they developed the uh, in Greece? Uh, the Mycenaeans were a, a type of um, pre-Greek Bronze Age culture, uh, which was on mostly the mainland Greece, like especially southern Greece. It's where they were, like on the Peloponnese, uh, is where mostly they were. Where they were. What main language did they adopt that was similar to Minoan writing? Uh, linear B, which was coined by Sir Arthur Evans. So you're like another pre-Greek language before Greek was developed, like archaic or old Greek. What type of cities are they famous for building? Which one was the most famous? Uh, they were known for building fortified type cities that were built on hilltops, kind of like a polis or city-state later. And, of course, the most famous was the city of Mycenae, which is located in the northern part of the Peloponnese, which is in southern Greece. Uh, who was the German archaeologist discovered and excavated sites like Mycenae and also Troy as well? That was Heinrich Schliemann. Uh, Schliemann, of course, very well known. 
uh, for trying to use the works of Homer to study these places. Uh, what was the Lion Gate? Uh, the Lion Gate was the main architectural entrance uh, to the city of Mycenae. Uh, what tombs were discovered or excavated uh, by Schliemann? Uh, they had the uh, uh, Tholos tombs. Probably already found, but he excavated them. I know some of it. Tholos tombs. And then they had the uh, grave circles that Schliemann mostly excavated there. What epic poems were the Greek poet Homer famous for writing? Uh, he wrote the Iliad, which is the most famous one about the Trojan War. And the, uh, the Odyssey is, of course, about King Odysseus. It's about like his adventures after the war, trying to get home back to, of course, Ithaca, which is not as famous as the Iliad. The Greeks saw the Iliad as like the Greek Bible uh, to them. Uh, what was the Trojan War? Uh, the Trojan War was believed to be some kind of Greek mythological type war that was between the Greeks, or what we call Mycenaean or Achaeans, versus the um, Trojans, who were in west, uh, northwestern Turkey. It took place close to about 1200 BC. Uh, and of course, there's a debate about whether it happened or not. They don't know uh, for sure. It's kind of a big debate. Uh, what was it? What was its main cause, according to Homer? Uh, they believe it was caused by uh, the Trojan Paris uh, taking or going with um, Helen of Troy uh, back to uh, what is Troy. And that, of course, caused the war to break out. So basically, the Greeks and Trojans fought over a woman, you know, more or less. Like I said, a face that launched a thousand ships, etc. Uh, who are the major characters in the Iliad? I told you Agamemnon was one of the of course, one that led the Greek forces uh, against the Trojans. He had a brother, of course, Menelaus, that ruled over Sparta. And then Agamemnon ruled over Mycenae. Uh, also, Achilles was very famous. He was one of the king, king of the Myrmidons, uh, who was their greatest warrior on the Greek side in the Trojan War. Suppose he invincible except for his Achilles heel. I'll tell you about Decius. He was the one, of course, that supposedly developed the um, Trojan horse idea uh, to help them win the war. And he was the king of Ithaca. Uh, other side had King Priam of the Trojans. He was the king that ruled over them. Then he had two sons, Hector uh, in Paris. Hector was the more famous one. He was uh, their greatest warrior or hero. And Paris was his younger brother. And Hector and Achilles, I told you, were famous for their famous battle. They fought single combat uh, where Hector was killed by, of course, Achilles. There's other characters too. Like I didn't talk about, I think there were two Ajaxes, I think you may have heard of. They were famous heroes on the Greek side. Aeneas, I forgot about Aeneas. He was uh, on the Trojan side. He was a cousin of King Priam. He would survive the war, which Virgil talks about, uh, the Greek, the Roman poet uh, in the Aeneid, which I'll get to that later when I get to the Romans talk about the Aeneid, which is kind of like a continuation story of the Trojan War. Oh, it says also in the Bible, what, what Turkish site did Schliemann possibly discover? Ancient Troy uh, called his Sarlik, which means, in, I think it means in Turkish, I believe it is, a uh, place of fortifications. And it's believed to be the ancient site of Troy, which is in northwestern Turkey, which is like a site that has like um, numerous cities built on top of each other, which Schliemann was one of the first to extensively excavated. So it might be Troy. Of course, it might not. I think it might be, but it's hard to say. So anyway, um, like I said, uh, in the, um, I guess, next lecture on Wednesday, I'll post that later when that's going to be. But I will be, of course, continuing with uh, discussing uh, ancient Greece. Uh, I am going to uh, continue talking about mostly the rise of the Greek city-states. So that's most of what I've got planned. Uh, coming up. Uh, and then probably next week we'll continue with Greece. It's probably going to take us like two weeks maybe to get through the Greek period. So that's it for today. Uh, like I said, don't forget, uh, by the way, remind you that uh, you got a bunch of assignments that are due this week. So don't forget about that. Some of you are kind of forgetting about it. I am sending, you know, like I said, reminders out about trying to do these assignments uh, and all that. So don't get behind. Oh, you know, you don't want to do that.
Uh, so that's it for today. I guess nobody has any questions because I didn't see anything posted or anything like that. But uh, let me know later if you have any questions at this lecture. I, of course, will post this uh, to my YouTube channel uh, for later. So that's it for today. I hope you all have a great week coming up on all that. And that's about it. So y'all take care.